So that means that I need to really finish. Let's see, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Why are weeks odd days? It would really be helpful if they were even days. <laughs> It's Natalie, also known as Nitty Natty. Welcome to episode 198 of the Love and Stitches podcast. Today, I am coming to you from a brand new state for me. We are in Tucumcari, New Mexico. We just crossed the border from Texas into Mexico, New Mexico last night. And even though I've driven through the state before, I'm not really counting it as visiting in the past, but now we've spent a night here. We're going to be exploring Route 66 later today and making our way across New Mexico. We'll actually be back here in a couple of weeks. We're going to be doing the, uh, can't remember what it's called. It's a wool festival. It's like October 6th and 7th. Actually, that reminds me, I need to add that to the events um, part of this podcast, but we will be back here very, very soon. Uh, speaking of, there is, we'll see, Today is the 198th podcast episode. We have one more next week, 199, and then we will be at the 200th episode. And I want to do a couple of special things for episode 200. So make sure to save the date for Thursday, October 5th. I'm going to be doing a live podcast at 12 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to be in Pacific time then. So it's going to be 9 a.m. for me. So you can find out like what time that is going to be for you in your time zone. But we're going to be live on YouTube. I'm really excited. I have some prizes to give away. I'm thinking about maybe doing some other special segments as well, but just make sure to save the date for that. All right. I have lots of projects to talk about as always. And I have many acquisitions to share as well, as well as some questions and stuff. So let's get right into the episode. First up today, let's talk about my tessellated pullover. So oops, I'm in the middle of a row. Uh, So this is the tessellated pullover by Andrea Mowry. And it is this year's Rhinebeck sweater. It is my Rhinebeck sweater, but it's her official Rhinebeck sweater knit along. So here is how it is looking. Get a little close up there. I've got all the yarns on my project page, but I'm using a kit from Farmer's Daughter Fiber um, that was put together for the sweater. So last week I had worked up to this flower right here and I thought I was ready to split for the front and back. So this sweater is worked from the bottom up, starting with the rib. You basically just work in a tube until you get to the underarm point and then you split, you work the front, you do some shaping, you work the back, you seam it, and then you work the sleeves down. So my goal was last week from like Monday through, or no, I guess from like Sunday to Saturday of last week, I was going to do the front and the back. I was going to be ready for sleeves by the time this podcast started. I knew that was a stretch, but it was much more of a stretch than I anticipated. So Last week I had finished uh, where I thought I wanted to be for the body, but I wanted to block it first and just check and make sure that it was the length that I wanted to actually get it, you know, try it on. So I put it on, try it on tubing. I soaked it. We were at, staying at a friend's house. So that was perfect timing for me to actually, you know, have plenty of water, have space, have extra towels and all the things that we don't have here in the van and block this piece. So I did that and mine did not grow at all. (laughs) It was 11 inches when I finished. I did add an extra inch because I knew I was going to need at least a little extra, extra length. And I think my size said go to 10 inches. So I added one inch before I stopped. So 11 inches before blocking, 11 inches after blocking. I don't know why. I've seen so many other people say that there's grew a lot. I guess it's something to do with the way that I knit and slip stitch and everything, or maybe it's something to do with the way that I blocked it. I didn't stretch it either way. I just let it block out and mine didn't grow. So 11 inches before, 11 inches after, and then I tried it on. I do have a picture of me trying it on. It's really hard to tell where I need to hold it up for the armpit because I know it's not going to be like right in the armpit, but is it like down here? Is it really far down? The yoke on this is going to be eight inches for me. So I tried measuring eight inches. I think I actually did it from 
the outside part of my shoulder down and I'm realizing that that probably wasn't the smartest measurement. It should probably be from the higher point of my shoulder down. And that got me to like basically right here. So it's kind of holding the sweater up right here <laughs> and just trying to see like how long would it be then? And it still wasn't quite long enough for me. I don't want it to be super long, but I also don't want it to be um, too cropped to wear with pants that I have. So I decided to add one more inch. So I'm now at 12 inches for the body. And then I just split the other day and look, I've got a little bit done. My gauge is definitely different working flat. And if I had been a really good gauge swatcher, I would have swatched flat and in the round since this pattern has both. But I can kind of see that my, my gauge looks a little taller uh, in the flat working in the flat. So I'm just going to keep an eye on things. I'm also thinking about adding another inch in uh, the like the top, the front and back portions, just because if Andrea Maori, the designer, has built in growth for those measurements and I'm not getting any growth, I need to add that in with actual inches and knitting. So I'm planning on probably adding a little more space in just like the plain knitting part here before I do all of the shaping. So things are looking pretty good. I still really want to finish this before October 5th when the West Knits MCAL starts. And in order to do that, I need to do the fronts and the backs this week. Today is Tuesday. So that means that I need to really finish. Let's see, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, why are weeks odd days? It would really be helpful if they were even days. Um, I guess I really need to finish the front by tomorrow. That's probably not going to happen, but I will do my best to get as much done as possible. And then if I can finish the front and back and start sleeve one for next week, sleeve two for the following week, then I will be done in time. It's going to be a really tight fit. So we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. I am, I'm pretty ready for this to be done now. Like it's, kind of lost its spark for me. Um, starting the front did help though, like doing something a little bit different. And I thought that working flat was going to be really annoying with slip stitching because in a lot of slip stitch patterns, when you're working on the wrong side, you have to bring your yarn front and back and front and back. But this one is designed really smartly. So when you're working on the wrong side, you're purling and your yarn is already on the wrong side where you need to slip it. So I'm actually I'm enjoying the change of pace and it is not too bad. Now I'm nearly through, got some tangles here. I am nearly through my first skein of spin cycle. So I need to grab my second one from the cabinet up there and wind that up and kind of figure out how I want to manage my yarn for the rest of this. Um, I'm not really sure if I want to try to make the back match. I know that I want to make the sleeves look similar. They don't need to be a perfect match, but I definitely don't want one whole sleeve to be one color and one to be the other. I've asked in several spaces about how other people are managing this, and I haven't seen anything yet that's exactly kind of what I'm thinking of doing. So I don't know. I'll let you know when I get that figured out. Oh, here's my lotion. I was looking for that. <laughs> so that's about it for that one. Um, there was definitely a big stall last week. I really didn't do a lot of knitting because I was waiting to block it. I don't think I got a block until maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. And then, and so I lost like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of knitting, and then it had to dry a couple of days. And then it was DFW Fiber Fest, so I didn't really work on it. So really lost a lot of knitting time last week, but now we are good, we are ready, we are excited, and I am hoping to get back on track. Being on the road, we have had our fair share of fast food and sandwiches, and honestly, we get pretty tired of it. So I'm always grateful when we are able to stop at a friend's house and get our Factor box sent to us. One of the great things about Factor is we can schedule it around our travel. So anytime we're somewhere for a couple of days, they deliver right on time and we get three full days of meals. Factor's meals are fresh and never frozen, which means I can pick something out, heat and eat it within two minutes and get something healthy to eat. This week we have some of our favorite options. The jalapeno lime cheddar chicken is always a favorite, but we also have a seafood option this week. The cavatappi and shrimp scampi looks really, really good. 
But today I am filling this vegetarian tamale bowl. Yep. This is my favorite part. So now I have two minutes to tell you about the juices that we got this week. So instead of smoothies, which I really love, we are trying the juices. We have pineapple, turmeric, and basil, apple beet ginger, carrot orange ginger, and apple kale and wheatgrass. I love turmeric and it can have so many benefits. So I'm gonna give this one a try while I wait. It's ready. As always, it's super good. <laughs> Head to factor75.com slash natty50 and use code natty50 to save 50% off your first box. Enjoy. We have rearranged and Toaster is now behind me so you can see him a little bit. Actually, he looks kind of cold. I can give him a blanket. <laughs> it's not that cold in here. Um, this is my crochet advent baby blanket that I made earlier this year that we brought for toaster out of all of my Pokemon colors. I am thinking about making myself one with one of my advents from this year and making it a little wider and a little longer. There you go, buddy. All right, he's cozy now. Let's talk about our next couple of projects. So I have two pairs of socks on the needles. They're both pretty similar in that they are just plain vanilla socks. I am working my perfect fit sock formula, uh, which is a class that I teach um, online. And the only difference is the yarns and that one is short and one is tall. Um, so let's start with these. These are from, the yarn is from Ruby and Roses and it is called Love and Roses. It is a was a collaboration that uh, Addie and I did with my membership. So this was a special color only members could purchase. It's now actually closed. So I've made a bit of progress. I finished up the heel and I worked through, I'm probably about halfway through the foot. I need to get some stitch markers in there so I can count and see how many foot rows I've done. But these are just, you know, I work on them when I can. This is the second sock. So hopefully they will be maybe complete in the next week, um, but no real rush on those. And then these ones, I forgot to put a progress keeper in, but I want to say I had maybe started the heel last week and now I am working my way through the foot. This one I did get stitch markers into, and this one I'm making a much longer leg. So this yarn is Leading Men Fiber Arts. And this is the Nitty Natty colorway. So this one is a collaboration, but it is available publicly. And so you can pre-order this colorway. It's a sock set. It comes with two minis called Kintergy and Toaster. And you can pre-order this through October 12th from Leading Men Fiber Arts. And if you do, you'll be supporting both of us. So I will put the link to that one down below. I'll continue having that one all the way through October 12th, actually tomorrow. I'm gonna be pulling a winner from the Instagram giveaway. We had some prototypes that we dyed up. If you saw that video with Leading Men Fiber Arts, we tried, this was actually the first, um, pro, uh, first try <laughs> that we did with those colors. And then we tried dyeing them a different way. And then we tried dyeing them a third way. And so we're giving away those extra ones because those are one of a kind. So not much to say about these, but I've just been keeping them. What are you doing? Why are you licking that pillow? <laughs> I've just been keeping them out. They've been great uh, for out and about knitting this week while I've been with friends in Dallas, uh, when I've got to football games and they're just keeping me company and making progress as I can. That brings me to my final project, which I am the most excited about right now. Ooh, these baskets, by the way, they're super great. They're like this ropey material the camera it doesn't even want to focus on them it's like blurring them out there now you can see it but they're lightweight and flexible and these were gifted to me from prairie what is it prairie bagworks i believe uh prairie bagworks right here i keep the tag on there so i don't forget but they're awesome i've just been keeping these you know one sock ready to go and then this is my hexagon blanket. So I am making the 
Summer Fade Hexi Blanket by Mallory. Yeah, Mallory Crawl but I am making lots of changes to it. And I've updated my Ravelry project page now. So it has tons of notes. I'm also thinking about doing maybe a Q&A on my Instagram in the next couple of weeks so that I can answer any other questions that might be coming up since I'm really just getting into things. So here's what it's looking like so far. I've only added one additional hexi since last week. And I only did this last night. Again, this whole week was really a lot busier than I thought it was going to be. I really thought I would have some evening time to hang out and go through my projects, but we spent our time in Dallas really hanging out with friends, getting a lot of work done, and that was all good and fine too. But last night I did have some time, so I added my second hexi, and I think, oh no, wait, oh, I did already do that. Where did I put that stuff away? Hang on, I know I have it here somewhere. I'm trying to get organized with all of the yarn. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about a few of the new details that I've added. So I have weighed this and I have learned that each hexi takes, oh, come in. Each hexi takes approximately um, 15 to 16 grams. That was when I was just doing the hexi on its own. I think it probably takes a little more. I'm, I'm sure it takes a little more when you are joining the hexes. So essentially 20 grams is plenty, although most of the yarns that I'm using are full 100 gram skeins of yarn. Um, I'm holding my yarns double because I'm getting fingering weight yarns. So I'm just holding them double like they're one strand. At first it was a little tricky with uh, you know the crochet hook and stuff, especially because there are puff stitches and cluster stitches but it's getting easier already. I've done a ton of practice before I got to these. I've also made some changes to the rounds. So I've worked around one and I think two as written in the pattern. Then I changed rounds three and four because for me, they were not coming out flat. And then I added around five. So my hexes are bigger than the one written in the pattern, but I've got all of those details on the project page. What else? Um, the size of them. I have that on here too, but hold on, I need to pull it up. Uh, let's see. So instead of being four inches across, four inches on the flat sides, and I think it was four and a half inches on the corners, the pattern is, mine are uh, 5.25 inches across and six inches across measured corner to corner, which is great because I really wanted to see a lot of these colors. So where are these yarns coming from? So these are yarns that I am collecting on my travels. I had intended to start this right when we started traveling just over a month ago, but I just wasn't ready yet. It's taken this long to really understand exactly how I want to do things and what I want the pattern to look like. So I am going to be busy for the next little while here getting caught up with all of the yarns that I've already purchased. I have probably up to 30 at this point. I am getting at least one yarn per state and the, my criteria are that the yarn is uh, locally dyed. So it's dyed somewhere there in the state, but sometimes I'm getting more than one yarn. And now that I realize I can get mini skeins, sometimes I'm getting like five or more colors in that state. So I think this blanket is going to end up being uh, non, no repeats. I think I'm going to be able to, you know, create this blanket just doing one uh, hexagon from each color. And I want to do this in order. So eventually my hope is that I will be, you know, we'll go to California. I'll get a California yarn. I'll wind it up. I'll add it to my blanket. And then I will either hang on to that yarn for future projects, whether it's um, I have another blanket planned for my travels. Uh, some people have been giving me such cute ideas, like I could make uh, stripy socks with each of the yarns that I'm using and have another way to remember the travels. I can make something for Toaster, I can make something for Kent. I mean, there's all these fun ideas and I'm not getting rid of yarns yet, but I also can't keep them all here with me in the van. There is so much here. Um, so some of the yarns I'm planning to keep and hang on to at least one per state I'm planning to keep and hang on to because I want to make this crazy intarsia United States map blanket and I will need one color per state. Um, other yarns I'm hanging on to for other projects. If I just really like the yarn, I may want to use it to make 
a pair of socks or something else. And then other yarns I'm going to be giving away to my membership, uh, either using it as a giveaway because it's still over 80 grams or um, we have a de-stash de channel that we use all the time. So it just kind of depends. Uh, I'll, I'm going to figure it out as I go. So I have a bunch of these uh, plastic bags. Thank you, Denise in Dallas, who gave all of these to me. And this is my plan. Once I finish with the hexagon, I am putting the label and the yarn all together. That is not staying super well. Uh, but basically what I'm doing is there's two ends, right? So when I am crocheting this, I'm pulling from the inside and the outside of the cake. So I need my yarns caked in order to do this, or I have to split them into, you know, multiple balls, which I might have to do sometimes. And then I'm taking the center strand and I am feeding it through the yarn label like that. That way I can just like set it on top and hold on. I figured this out last night. I got so organized on this last night. It felt so good. And then I can just, you know, wrap around it a couple times. It's not perfect. It's not like this is going to stay perfectly, but it's enough for me to remember which label belongs to which yarn. And then it can go in these plastic bags. So eventually I'm probably going to have um, bags of yarn again for that blanket, that intarsia blanket that I'm going to definitely keep. And I don't know how much I'm going to need. So I'm just going to send those home to Tennessee. And then I might have other yarns that I know I'm not going to use and I'm going to give those away. But let's talk about the new Hexi that I have added here. And I'm also keeping all of the names. I'm going to keep up with this hopefully for the whole entire time, but I'm writing all of the names and the dyers and the states on the bottom of the project page. And then I also have an Instagram highlight where I've got a picture with the yarn label and everything. So all of this will be memorialized in a way. Uh, but this yarn is from Deep Dyed Yarns. And this color is called, uh, wait, what was it called? Oh, Run for the Roses. And it's something about the horse racing, I think. See how that's attached onto there? So I'm going to tuck that one back in. This is an interesting yarn because I believe it has bamboo in it. And actually my next one has bamboo too. This yarn I got in Kentucky. It was a gift from Tamara. So thank you, Tamara. And I'm so happy to add it into my blanket. Now I've made one other big discovery and change for this blanket. My original plan was to work from corner to corner. So this first one from Tennessee, the first state that we started in, was going to be my first corner. And then I was gonna work, you know, building rows. So I would add two hexagons, then three hexagons, then five hexagons, I think is how it goes. And I thought that was probably the best idea for a blanket that I don't know how many colors I'm going to end up with. Because then when I'm about halfway done, I can stop going out from the corner and start coming in. But as I was watching the tutorial of how to join these, I learned that you can really join them anywhere. Like I could stop and add a hexagon over here or here or here. It doesn't really matter as long as it's consistent, it just looks the best. And the designer actually said, you know, you could start from the center and then work in circles going out. That way you could just use up all the yarn you have and you could stop when it was big enough. And I thought that's what I need to do. I have no clue when I'm going, where, how many I'm going to end up with but it's definitely gonna be more than 50 because I'm already at like, I said 30 maybe, um, but I might need to add repeat some of these colors and that's fine, but I won't know until the end. And I could also do like one solid color on the outside. I don't know, I just think this is gonna be the best way to do it. So this is going to be my center, my Tennessee yarn. I love how this yarn looks, it's so pretty. Again, all the yarns are gonna be listed in the project page, but I think it's kind of cool that our first date and where I grew up is in the center of the blanket. And then I will be going around adding six hexagons. And then I will do another layer and another layer. And I'm also thinking eventually I can stop making it more like hexagonal and I can start just adding 
uh, corners, like kind of making it more rectangular. So I think that should work. I am really excited about this way of doing it. I want the blanket to be representative of the travel that we're doing, which is why to me it feels important, at least right now, to add the yarns in the order that I got them. So this was Tennessee, Kentucky number one, and then I have a second Kentucky yarn that I purchased at a store that I'm gonna be adding in next. And you can see this one was where I was practicing. Look how uh, not flat that one is. That's why I changed this pattern. So now I've got it all set out and ready for my next one. Obviously I'm not gonna be able to keep the blanket in there for very long, but for right now, this system is working out great. <laughs> This week I went to one yarn store, but I also got two exciting packages. And then I went to a fiber festival. So <laughs> we are still acquiring yarn here. So the first store that I went to is McKinney Knittery. It is north of Dallas in McKinney, Texas, and it is such an amazing store. We filmed a tour there and you will see that in about a month, but it's a store that I used to go to pretty often when I lived in Dallas. Uh, my friend Rebecca and I would meet there on some weekends and we would spend time, you know, looking at the yarn, sitting and knitting and then going to lunch. And it was just such a fun time. And downtown McKinney is such a cute place as well. So I didn't get a yarn for my blanket there because I knew I was going to DFW Fiberfest and I was going to see lots and lots of Texas yarns, but there was a yarn that I just couldn't resist. And it is this one already caked up because I just want to be ready to go. I'm getting my yarns caked when I can. This is a self striping yarn from, I think it's Night Owl Fibers. Look, they have it uh, twisted around the label there so you don't lose it. So smart. Yes, Night Owl Fibers. And this colorway is called Wicked Beetlejuice. And as you know, we love Beetlejuice here in this family. Our van is named Lydia from Beetlejuice. That's one of the characters. So this hat, or this hat, this yarn is going to be a Muscleboro hat for Kent. I'm probably going to start it uh, when I finish uh, maybe one of those pairs of socks and just get it going and have this as something that I make kind of during September and October for Halloween. So I haven't made a Muscleboro hat in a little bit, so it'll be fun. And I've never done one with self-striping yarn. I've done one with stripes, but it was mini skein. So that was a little bit different. So got that at McKinney Knittery after our tour. And also Night Owl Fiber has a ton of really cool uh, Christmas colors as well. All right, then um, I had been waiting on a package from a homespun house and it was supposed to go to my parents. And so if you remember, I was making the Battenberg blanket. I was crocheting it with a homespun house advent from 2022. And I needed some, a neutral yarn to pair with it. So I finished all of my squares that are like little tiny uh, solid granny squares. I finished all of them at the end of June. And then I thought, okay, all throughout July, I'm going to join this blanket together. I'm gonna to use a neutral, it's gonna be great. So there's just as many colorful squares as there are um, neutral colored squares. So I ordered my yarn from a homespun house. She's in Germany. Um, she sends it, uh, it arrives like in the middle of July and only four out of six skeins were there. And I was like, oh no, we must have had a miscommunication. So I let Molly know, oh, there's only four skeins, but I need six skeins. And she was like, um, I sent six skeins and I sent you some sock sets. And so whatever happened with that package in July, is still a mystery. We we're never, never able to find it. Um, I went to the post office, never able to recover it. So Molly sent me another package, um, this time with the six skeins again and some more of the sock sets, which was really nice of her. And uh, so I was, you know, keeping an eye on it, but it was supposed to go to my parents and I was thinking I'll just get it in November when I'm back and complete that blanket then. So my parents are supposed to send me a package while we're in Texas for a week with things that we have left behind. And I also wanted to see if my yarn from a homespun house had arrived. It was sent in July and it hadn't yet. And I was like, oh no, that's 
why a second time with this package? So I reached out to Molly and she was like, well, it said that they attempted delivery, um, but they couldn't deliver it because nobody was there to sign for it. And I'm looking at the address and I'm like, wait a second, this address is not in Tennessee where my parents live. It's in Texas. Why did it get sent to Texas? And it turns out that it was sent to my old address at our town home that we used to live at in Texas, which is uh, when I had last ordered from a homespun house. And so that was not good, right? Because it did not get sent to the right place. But the good news is that we just happened to be in Texas that week. And you know, Texas is a big state. We just happened to be a half hour from where I used to live. So I was able to go to the post office. I'm guessing that had package had been attempted to be delivered like 20 days ago. And I think I caught it on one of the last days before it got sent back to Germany. So just the sheer luck of being able to like find it and then actually being there nearby and able to pick it up is just crazy. The things this yarn has gone through um, to get to me. So I'm so happy to say that the package arrived. I was able to pick it up. Everything is there and I can't wait to show it to you. So the first thing is my six skeins for my blanket. And since we, you know, it didn't work out the first time, we decided to change it up a little bit. And instead of doing just the plain neutral color, we did it on gold Stellina. And Stellina always has a hard time. Oh no, it's getting picked up. Great. Look how fun that is. So this is a, a homespun house antique on gold Stellina. I've got six skeins of this <laughs> that I am going to be using to assemble my Battenberg blanket. I'm thinking I'm going to do this in November when I'm back. So I've got all these beautiful skeins now and I am planning to send them home <laughs> so that they can be waiting for me at home when I get back in November. They're doing me no good here right now except taking up space. So I'm like so happy to have my eyes on them. They came out so beautiful. I cannot wait to finish this blanket now. I am so excited for it. So that is one thing that has come into, <laughs> into the stash. And then Molly also sent me some beautiful sock sets. So the first one is this one called Dancing in the Street. I'll show you the name first. Dancing in the Street. And she said she picked these out for me. So you can tell, you know, a beautiful speckled pink. And this one has two really bright and fun mini skeins. So I can't wait to make something out of that maybe a pair of socks or maybe a Musselboro hat. Can't have too many hats. This one is a really cool one. This is her Patreon uh, from May. It's their sock set. So if you're a Patreon of Molly's, I guess you can get fun sock sets. That's exciting. And it's called Drive-In Movie. And it's so pretty. And this one's a 50 gram with a 20 gram. So that's still plenty to do a pair of socks, but I really like that color. And then she said she wanted to send something for Kent, maybe some colors that he would like. So this one's called It's Okay to Be Alone. And it's a really pretty speckled blue with a really nice gray and super, super soft. So that was so exciting to get. There's also one more thing that she sent me. It's in here and it's going to be on the 200 uh, episode 200 giveaway. So keep an eye out for that so you can enter to win something very exciting and beautiful. But that was a really exciting long story to tell you that a package that has been trying to get to me since July is finally here. Okay, I got one other thing. I ordered a GeoGradient set from Ruby and Roses. And I have it right here. I haven't looked at it yet. I know what the colors are. We planned them out together. So ready? Let's pull them out. <gasps> Ooh, yes, I am so excited for this. If you would like to get one of these GeoGradient kits or anything with Ruby and Roses, I do have an affiliate link with them and I will have it down below. I'm going to always have it in my description box now. If you're a new customer with them, you can save $5 off your first purchase. And if you're a returning customer using the link, just helps me out. It gives me a little bit of a kickback. All right, so let's open this up. This is so pretty. So the Geo Gradient is Stephen West, uh, West Knits MCAL, Mystery Shawl 
knit along for this year. It starts October 5th and I am excited for it. Even though I kind of felt a little tortured last year, I'm excited for this year. And I decided to not get solid colors and go with some speckleds and variegated. We'll see how that turns out. I think it's gonna be fun. I like these colors regardless. So the first one that I got is called Party Dress. My next one in my fade is Cosmopolitan. And all these colors are available individually too. The next one is a renamed color. It is called a Calliope, I think is how you say it. And then the final one, the darkest one is Deep Affection. I think that's gonna be super, super pretty. Let me get them back in order here. Oh, and this yarn is so soft. This is the Soft Bros 8515 Superwash Merino and nylon. So I am very excited for that. And I really want to get my sweater done so I can fully embrace shawl knitting and just absolutely go for it. Now, like I said, I'm trying to figure out where to put these on the floor for now. I did go to a fiber fest this week and I got a lot of yarn there, but I did that haul in the DFW Fiberfest video. So if you want to see everything that I got at DFW Fiberfest, <laughs> you will have to go watch it there. It's at the end of the video. Um, I got a lot of Texas yarns, a lot of really fun show colorways, and it was a great time. So the yarn stash is it's getting problematic. Um, it's about four tote bags full now and it sits like so where I am right now I'm in the back of our van and there's a bench seat and then we kind of like there's two other seats here in front of me so our backpacks are always like tucked in here when we're driving but now our my, all my yarn is sitting on the floor and then when we park for the night all of it goes into the front passenger seat and footwell and so it's becoming a problem but I've been saying this for a while, but it feels truer and truer each time I say it. Once I start working through my blanket yarn, I will be sending stuff home or sending stuff out. So that will start going down. I'm going to send some of the yarns that I don't need right now, like the ones for my blanket back to Nashville. And then I also have stuff that I need to just sit down and give away to my membership and ship that stuff out. So eventually, you know what, we're not going to have all this mess on the floor and it'll feel like we get some extra square footage. The questions this week have taken on a sock theme. I didn't really do it on purpose at first, but I just realized that there was a lot of sock questions. So then I just kept going with all of the sock questions, except for one at the end. So here is the first one from AM Fibers. When knitting socks for someone else, how do you know how big to make them? Do you ask them to measure their foot? If so, what measurements do you ask for? Or do you just ask for their shoe size and hope for the best? Also, I'm loving your travel content. It's like I'm living vicariously through you. We have five cats, two dogs, and two rabbits. So van life is a no-go for us. That's really fun though. You have a whole zoo. So there's a few different ways you can figure out um, how to make socks for somebody. Uh, shoe size is the broadest way and maybe the one with the least accuracy, but it's still gonna be pretty good because you have to remember like, if you go to the store to buy socks, given store-bought socks have a lot more elasticity, but if you go to the store to buy socks, it's not like you have to buy your exact size. It's a big range. It's like five to nine or something like that, at least I think in the socks that I buy. So don't stress too, too much about it, um, but shoe size is a great place to start. There's a ton of different places. You can Google, um, they sell sock rulers. Uh, Twice Shared Sheep has a really cool like slap bracelet sock rulers that are awesome. Um, but you can find all different kinds of charts, even free resources online that tell you like, hey, if it's a women's or a kid's or a men's shoe size this, then make your sock like about this many stitches or about this many inches wide or about this long in the foot. So you can find all of that information. That's probably the best way if you wanna be sneaky about it because then you can have somebody else like look at their shoe size. Now, if you wanna get a little bit more 
um, precise, um, you can ask for measurements. So that is something actually I teach in my Perfect Fit Socks course, which is available at any time. It's an on-demand class, so you can purchase it and then just start going through the lessons on your own. And then I'm here to help. I answer um, comments and emails to help you through the process. But basically it's a series of measurements. You do it for yourself first. So this is a, this is a slower process, but it's the most accurate. You do it for yourself first. You make one sock so you can understand how the formula works. And then I give you a, basically a whole math sheet where you can just type in measurements and it spits out a formula for you, hence the perfect fit formula. Um, so that information on that course is linked down below. But uh, if you don't, in the course, I give you a YouTube video that's unlisted that you can send to your, um, if they're, you know, if somebody doesn't live near you and you're not going to measure their feet, you can send it to them and tell them what measurements to take. And then they can report back their numbers for you. So it's like a 10 minute video where they just go through and they do their measurements to make it really easy on them. Now, not everybody needs something quite that precise. Maybe it's the first time you're making socks for somebody or it's a coworker or something and you're like, I'm not gonna get that fidgety about it. There's also just a few basic measurements you can take that can give you a really good insight. So this one is, this is my perfect fit sock um, long. You're probably not going to notice a lot of things about it right away, but if you really get into it, you will see I've got um, increasing here before the heel. I've got decreasing after the heel. That's pretty normal, especially with a gusset, but not as normal with a short row heel. And then I have specialized toes. So what you can have somebody do, the basic measurements that you would need, if you're going to make a tall sock, you want a measurement around the point on their leg where the sock is going to end. You want a measurement around the ankle and you want a measurement around the ball of the foot. Now, most traditional sock patterns, the size is based on the ball of the foot, but as many of us know, if you just knit a sock based on the ball of your foot, that's like where the toe joints are. Basically, if this was a foot, it would be around here where my knuckles are. Your whole foot is not that way. Your ankle may not be that way. Maybe smaller or um, bigger or your leg. Of course, for many of us, our legs, our calves are much bigger than the ball of our foot. So it's not really great to have the same stitch count all throughout, but it does work and socks are very forgiving. So to summarize, the broadest measurement would be shoe size and just go off of that. The next best thing would be to ask for a couple of measurements around the leg where you want the sock to end around the top of the ankle and around the foot. That's You're gonna still have to do some math based on your gauge and everything to figure out the best stitch counts to go with. And then the most accurate thing would be taking lots and lots of measurements. And if that sounds intimidating, I have the perfect fit sock course. That is still a lot, but it makes it a lot easier too. On to the next sock question. This one is from Lori. Hi, Natalie. I ordered the Nitty Natty Color Fway from Leading Men, and I was curious if you will be doing a knit along. I know it may not be that easy because everyone will not be receiving their yarn at the same time. However, if you are doing a cowl, I would be happy to wait for it. You might have already mentioned it. If so, I missed it. I haven't said anything about it because I didn't think about it. I thought about it a little bit, but then I, I was feeling the same way, like, oh, it'd be too difficult. Everyone will have their yarn at a different time. But then I thought about it a little more and figured, you know what, we could just start November 1st. All of the yarn is going to ship by October 31st. And that is, again, this yarn. You can pre-order it through October 12th. It's supposed to all ship by October 31st, but I know some is arriving already because they had some already dyed up. But yeah, that would be fun. We could do a little a little month long make along, maybe from November 1st to November 30th. I thought about maybe pulling in a couple of uh, uh, bonus things with like maybe a really low cost, like a $5 cost and you can get a discord and maybe a couple of events. If that sounds fun, let me know and I will work on putting that together. Maybe we can even pull in um, Steve and Andy the Dyers and do something uh, fun one night for an event. So I think that would be a really good idea. So let me think about the details. Let me know if that's something that's interesting to you and I will um, announce it when it is ready. Okay, next up, a question from Christy. 
Hi, Natalie. I saw you and Kent at DFW Fiberfest, but you were busy picking out some a chick that knits yarn, so I didn't want to interrupt. Um, or I didn't want to interrupt to say hi. So, hi. My question, I am a brand, brand new knitter, and my by brand new, I mean I have only made swatches, nothing else. My goal is to knit a pair of socks. Do you recommend a toe-up pattern for new knitters or a top-down pattern? Thank you. Okay, so first of all, if you see me, Kent, Toaster, at a show, please come up and say hi. There was only a couple people I had to say, and I felt so bad about this at DFW. I had to be like, we can't chat right now. We have to come back. And that was because we were doing a, a live Zoom with my members. And I didn't want to like stop and chat with people while my members were there waiting for us to show them around the thing. But then we were able to come back to those people. So don't feel bad about coming up to us. Most of the time when we're filming, it's things that we can pause and stop doing for a second. So please come up to us. Don't be shy. Um, as a brand new knitter, which way is best to knit your first pair of socks? Top down or toe up? My opinion is that it is best to start at the cuff. So top down, because if you start here, especially on a longer sock, you are going to be doing nothing really super new at first. Maybe it's new for you to knit on really tiny yarn or new for you to knit in a small circumference in the round. That is all fine. You're gonna be knitting a tube for at least four, maybe six, maybe eight inches, depending on how long you want your sock to be. Before you do anything special, any kind of special stitches that are more uniquely socks. So that's why I think it's best to start at the top and just get comfortable with that. If you start at the toe, you have to start right away with a very special cast on and then you have to increase and it's just like, it's too much. The other reason I like top down or cuff down for first socks is you can try on the foot as you go. So you can't really do this if you have double pointed or nine inch circular needles, but if you are working other methods like this, I can put this sock on right now. My stitches will just stretch right over my foot and I can put it on. Not gonna do it because you don't need to see my feet, <laughs> but um, that's those are two reasons for me that I think it's best for uh, first time sock knitters to do cuff down. Now I did already talk about my Perfect Fit Socks course, which is good for people who have been knitting socks for a long time and want to like refine their sock knitting, but it's also good for beginners because I go through everything like, like I want, I try to explain it like you haven't seen it before. However, if you want a, a place to start that's a little less mathy and a little less specific, I also have an entire series for free on my YouTube channel for knitting socks from the cuff down. So I'm gonna link it in the questions below, the course and the free series, and you can start with that. Um, and that's a really great place to start with sock knitting is just use somebody else's numbers, make the sock, see how it fits you, and then make tweaks from there. That's how we all do it. I feel like most of us have to make a couple pairs of socks before we really um, you know, get it tweaked and get it perfect for us. So good luck. You can do it. It's not as scary as it seems. Let's see. Next up, we have a question from Ella Marie. Do you have any pattern suggestions for sock sets that come with two mini skeins? It can be sock patterns or whatever else. I'm just struggling to come up with a pattern for a sock set that I have. Yes, I do. I have two suggestions for you. And of course, anyone who has any suggestions can leave them down below. Where did that sock set just go? I have one from a homespun house that has two, that's not it. I also have a couple from Ruby and Roses that I've recently gotten. Okay, great. So sock sets that come with too many skeins. So first off, it sounds like you want to use all the colors together, but I'm also just going to put this out here. You can separate things and you don't have to use them together. I feel like I need to say that because for me, I always think like I have to use the things that came together together. And then there are people whose brains are different than that. And they're just like, oh, I like this. I'm just going to pull it out and use it. And like my brain doesn't work that way, but I'm trying to learn to be that way. So for anyone else who's in the mindset like me, where you're like, I have to use these colors together. I also have to use all three of them. No, you don't. <laughs> you can use just one. You can use none. You can use them for separate things. Just putting that out there. But it sounds like you want to use all of them together. So First suggestion is, is, of course, socks. I really like to use both the colors 
to do the heels, toes, and cuffs. So maybe like for me, I am a fan of this blue more than the orange. So I might use the blue to do the cuffs and the toes of both socks and use the orange for the heels. Or I might make my pair of socks like fraternal twins. So they're both a little bit different. They both use the pink as the main color, but maybe one starts with the orange and has orange cuffs and toes with a blue heel. And then the other one has blue cuffs and toes with an orange heel. So they're like mismatched. I've also seen where people will do like a couple of stripes in the ribbing with one color while keeping the ribbing at the top this color, like cast on with this one. I know Crazy Sock Lady does her like pop of color. So you could do like a couple cast on and a couple stripes with this or a couple rows with this, switch to this for the rest of the cuff and just have them in there together. And there's endless possibilities. Um, something else I'm just thinking of now too, in the, um, in the toe portion, something that I've done in the past that I got from one of Summer Lee's patterns, she's a sock designer, is before maybe like 12 rows before you start the toe, introduce your toe yarn. So let's say I was using this blue one. So I would do like two stripes. Uh, tw this is 12 rows before starting the toe decreases. Two stripes, two stripes back and forth so that I had three stripes of the blue um, before I start the toe. I have a couple of socks like this. I don't have them on me right now, but it's very, very cute. So it basically endless possibilities with socks. Um, I can think of one thing that is not socks that I've seen that's really, really cute. And that's all I have for you today. So hopefully <laughs> there's more that um, comes up in the comments, but I've seen somebody do a really cute muscle burrow hat with a sock set like this. So what they did is they did the crown for both sides. So the muscle burrow hat is, is that really long oblong hat that gets folded up inside itself. So they use the main color for both crowns, but in the center they did, I think it was maybe about three inches with one mini and three inches with the other mini. So the hat would be pink, but then the brim on one side would fold up and be blue. If you flipped it inside out, the brim on the other side would fold up and be orange. So if you like your colors for a hat, I think that's a very, very cute solution. I don't know for sure you can get three inches out of a, a, a two uh, 20 gram mini, but you can figure it out by, um, once you get into the body of your hat, you could weigh your main color, knit for an inch, and then weigh it again and see like how many grams you need to make um, an inch so that you can plan accordingly. Okay, hopefully that helps. And again, leave more suggestions down below if you can think of them. This might be, oh no, wait, one more sock question and I think we have another question. So this one is from Becky. Can you use the fish lips kiss heel in both toe up and cuff down, or is it just for toe up? When I searched the tutorial for tutorial videos on YouTube, I could only find them for toe up. So you can use the fish lips kiss heel for cuff down or toe up socks. You work it exactly the same as far as I'm concerned. Like I've done it my, for myself for many toe up and many cuff down socks. It fits me exactly the same. So you can totally do both. Um, as far as tutorial videos on YouTube, I'm concerned that you're finding tutorial videos on YouTube, not with you, with the videos because it's a paid for pattern. So you shouldn't be seeing any tutorials out there for paid for patterns because it reveals what's in the pattern, unless it's from the designer themselves. Um, so be wary of that. Okay, last question here. This one is not about socks. That was fun though. We got a lot of sock stuff going on. I hope you enjoyed that if you're, even if you're not a sock knitter. Uh, this is an interesting question. So I just had to pick this one. This one is from Emily. I love how normal and natural you are on camera. You have so many followers and you don't let the fame get to your head as far as I can tell. My question is, do you ever feel like Nitty Natty is a character when you're filming? It doesn't seem like it, but I would like to hear your perspective. <laughs> okay, so I have to laugh because I'm like, wait, I am not. I am not famous. Um, it's so funny to hear that. And it's always like really fun to, um, to meet people. And, uh, it's still like a really strange feeling that other people are excited to meet me, if that makes sense. So this is feedback that I've gotten a few times. And when I met, was meeting people this weekend at DFW Fiberfest, they were saying the same thing that they felt like I was really authentic. So I just have to say, thank you for saying that. That's like, really 
positive, meaningful feedback for me. And I just appreciate it so, so much. Um, I just thought it was an interesting question. So I thought, let's talk about it because it's kind of like a, a weird thing. It's, I feel like it's kind of like breaking through the, the wall of like the camera and everything. So I do not feel like Nitty Natty is a character. I feel like I am like, that is who I am. I am, I am this passionate about knitting when I'm on camera, when I'm off camera, all of the time. I love to knit. Um, the things I talk about are the things I would talk about in real life. Um, but we do have to, you know, I do think that <clears throat> there's a certain sense of when I'm on camera or when I'm meeting people that I have a little extra pep, you know, kind of like everyone has a telephone voice. Like when you answer the phone, you sound a little bit different because you're just, you're ready to talk. You're ready to um, put on like a good impression. It doesn't mean it's not authentic. It just means it's maybe like a little, a little step above, a little, a little more pepped up um, than it may be constant throughout the day. Like for 24 hours a day, do I talk like this? Absolutely not. <laughs> that would make me, I think that would, I would make myself crazy if I did that. I'm sure that would drive Kit nuts. Um, but this is still very much like who I am in real life. So I don't feel like it's a character at all. There are, I thought of, um, let's see, I thought of like one thing that I do actually try to make sure that I don't do on camera, two things, two things that I try to make sure that I don't do on camera or when I'm meeting people. <laughs> Number one is I watch my language way more. I really try to make this podcast like something you can watch when you have little kids in the room. So I, you know, don't, I try not to say any uh, curse words. I try not to say anything too explicit. Um, and I, but I also do that when I meet new people, right? Like I don't just meet a new person and, you know, drop a lot of dirty words or like make a lot of comments or anything because I want, I'd only do that with like close friends and family or like maybe when I'm driving by myself, <laughs> if that makes sense. So that's one thing that I do make sure to edit out. If you're surprised by that, yes, I am. Sometimes I do drop some some dirty words <laughs> sometimes. Um, not dirty words, like, uh, I guess, curse words. I'm trying not to say dirty because they're just words. Um, and then the other thing that I, this is my biggest fear when meeting people in person is that um, I don't want anyone that I'm meeting in person to feel like I wasn't um, like to walk away feeling um, unsatisfied with that interaction. So obviously all of us have up and down days, up and down moments. We're not always in a good mood and that's a completely fair thing to feel. I always feel like whenever I meet somebody, if like the reaction wasn't as warm as I hoped, or maybe if it felt awkward or whatever, that like, that doesn't mean that that's how they feel towards me. That doesn't mean that's how they are all the time. It could have been a stressful moment or an awkward moment, or they could have like talked to 50 people before me and they are tired and they are like, have to go to the bathroom so bad and they're trying to get that way. And so they're not frustrated with me. Anyway, I think about all the scenarios. So I'm very, very mindful when I meet people thinking about like, if this is the only time that I'm getting to meet somebody, I want it, I want to put on my best self for them. And I want them to walk away feeling that I was happy to, or knowing that, the, that I was happy to meet them, feeling good about it, giving them time. Um, so that's the only other thing is like, I really try to um, reserve my energy elsewhere so that like I have the energy to do the meet and greets and stuff like that. I am an introvert and I love meeting people. I'm not shy, but I do get to a point where I feel, um, you know, socialized out. And so like after DFW Fiberfest this weekend, which was so much fun, um, it, we back, got back in the car yesterday and I was just like, <laughs> like just completely shut down. I felt very snippy and all of that stuff. And that's just, that's just the reality. I needed to, I needed to go within to build back up my energy reserves. I was planning to podcast yesterday and I was like, nope, the mood is not there and it's not ready for that, for that right now. And I woke up today, I am refreshed. I feel so much better and I feel like myself again. So that's, I hope that answers the question. I thought that was just a really interesting one. And so 
um, I wanted to share my thoughts on that one. If you do have any questions for me, make sure to leave them down below with hashtag question in the front, and I'll be sure to answer them in the next podcast. This week, we took a bit of a break from yarn store tours to go to DFW Fiber Fest for our Tuesday video. So that one is still a lot of yarn and a lot of shopping. We went around to eight booths at DFW Fiber Fest. I want to say that was only a tenth of what was there. I didn't count specifically, but there had to have been 80 to 100 booths. It was a great, great festival. I didn't take any classes this year, so that wasn't included, um, but it was just a really, really great time. And so that video is out there. You can also see all of the things that I purchased um, at DFW Fiberfest and see a lot of really fun Texas yarns. If you do want to maybe get your hands on some of those show colorways, I suggest watching through that sooner rather than later because some of the dyers um, probably have a limited amount left over, if any, that they are going to be um, selling online. Next week, we are back to yarn store tours. We are gonna be going to Missouri to Lee's Summit, which is just outside of Kansas City. And we're going to Unwind Fiber Arts. This is a fantastic store. If you are in the Kansas City area, you might've gone on the Kansas City Yarn Crawl um, last weekend, but it's a really great store. They have um, a really, uh, they have a, I'm trying to think of the right way to say it. Um, they have more, a more selective um, options, although they still have a ton of yarn lines, but they go deep within those yarn lines. So like they have Emma's yarn, but they have an entire wall of Emma's yarn. They have Lobby Anime, but they have an entire wall of Lobby Anime. They have such great stuff in there. And it's a really cool setup in their yarn shop. So we'll be going there next week and I have a giveaway in that video as well. So keep an eye out for it. Now I have some events to talk about. So the first one coming up is my live episode 200 podcast. So mark your calendars for Thursday, October 5th. I'm going to be going live at 12 p.m. Eastern time, which again is 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'll be reminding you in all the podcasts leading up to it, but we're just going to have a good time. I'm going to do my basic segments. I am not going to do a question segment because I'll, and I'm anticipating I'll be answering some questions throughout and interacting with people in the chat. I'm going to be giving away some really beautiful, a really epic um, prize during that episode and maybe a couple other things. Or I might save the prize for the comments and give away a couple smaller things during the episode. Haven't quite decided <laughs> yet, but we're gonna have a great time. Uh, after that, on October 7th and 8th, that's a Saturday and Sunday, it is the Mountain and Valley Wool Festival in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We are going to be there. I don't know which day yet, um, but we're planning to be there. We're planning to film there. Um, so maybe I will see some of you there. Uh, then, actually, wait, I have this out of order. Sorry. Uh, October 5th as well is the uh, Geo Gradient West Knits MCAL kickoff. Um, that pattern is dropping that day. And if you haven't done a mystery uh, make along before, the way this one and many work is that you can purchase the pattern ahead of time. And then on set dates, new parts of the pattern come out. So this one is a shawl. So on October 5th, the first clue will come out and it's basically just the first couple of sections of the pattern. And then every following Thursday for four total Thursdays, um, you will get uh, more things to go for the pattern. And that's the Ruby and Roses yarn that I got. Uh, this is the last thing. Um, Rhinebeck is coming up October 20th through the 22nd. So I am calling Rhinebeck like the entire weekend. Um, what many people refer to as Rhinebeck is the New York Sheep and Wool Festival, which is just Saturday and Sunday, the 21st and 22nd. But there are also three events on Friday, the 20th. Uh, and there it is Indian Tangled, Cake Palooza, and Woolen Folk. I have links to all of those websites down below. And specifically for the New York Sheep and Wool Festival, I linked the, the page where you can get tickets. Um, you don't have to get your tickets ahead of time, but you do save a couple bucks if you do. So I put all that out there. It will be 
in my podcast from now until the event happens so that you can have easy places to find information on all those things. I also linked a playlist that I created with all of my past Rhinebeck videos. So if this is your first time that you're going or you just want to reminisce or you want to plan ahead, um, you can watch through those videos. I include a lot of information. I've only been for two years, so I don't know everything. Um, so feel free to add any little tidbits of information in the comments. For the past eight nights, we stayed in Dallas at one of our friend's houses. He has a really big house with a nice fenced in yard and he has a dog named Summer who is super cute. So Toaster really liked that, um, but we really enjoyed getting a break from the van. We got to pull everything out of here. We got to wash everything. We got to clean everything. We got to kind of just like mentally reset, physically reset, really enjoyed taking showers without shower shoes. It was really, really great. We did spend most of the week working. I had really big plans to get so much more done than we did, but you know what? Um, we really just soaked in our week in Dallas. So we, we used to live in Dallas. Kent grew up there. Um, I lived there for seven years, so we still have lots of friends there um, that we wanted to see. We also uh, filmed a video on Wednesday. We filmed at McKinney Knittery, and that took most of the day. And then we spent some time hanging out there, um, knitting and getting to know some people after we filmed. Then we spent the majority of Friday filming at DFW Fiber Fest. And then I spent um, the rest of Saturday, or I spent Saturday um, going to Fiber Fest with my friend Brooke, um, who's Wonderlust Fibers. And we shopped. And then I stayed and hung out and just knitted, and it was a really great time. We also went to an SMU game on Saturday. So Kent went to college at SMU in Dallas. They were playing football. Um, the weather was actually very, very nice. So uh, my friend Rebecca, that you may remember from those Rhinebeck videos from 2021, we got to meet up there and we sat together and knitted. So I have a picture of us with our socks. Um, she's knitting from a sock tube so, with some SMU colors. And I was working on my leading men fiber art sock. And then just a nice picture of us that her husband took at the game. So that was really fun. We had a great week. I had a list of things that I wanted us to do. Um, things that we wanted to do, like cleaning out the van. We got most of that done. Work things to do. But then also like fun things. Like I wanted to go to Whataburger. So we made sure we went to Whataburger. Um, we wanted to get Korean barbecue. So we made sure to go to Korean barbecue. Um, we went to trivia. No, I, I'm sorry. I went to uh, a burger place that my roommate, Brooke, Brooke was my roommate in Dallas for three years um, that we used to go to all the time. So that was like bringing back the memories. Um, then we went to a uh, trivia together on Thursday night, a big group of us. And then on Friday night, we went to Korean barbecue. And on Saturday, we went to the game. Yeah, I think that was that was everything that we did. And so, yeah, it was a really, really great week. On Sunday, we packed back up the car. It took us like three hours <laughs> to pack up the car. And then we headed to West Texas to Pampa, where Kent's uncle lives. His, his mom grew up there, but his uncle's still there. And we stayed one night with them. They had a really cool house. They were um, backed up right to like a cow pasture. So you could see the cows grazing. Um, it, was, it was really cool. And Toaster definitely enjoyed that. So last night, Sunday, no, Monday night was our first night back in the van after eight nights away. And uh, I feel like, you know, not too many like big adjustments. We're kind of getting right back into it. I'm actually very happy to be back on the road um, and traveling again. So we're in New Mexico right now. We just got here last night and we are going to be in New Mexico, I think for just a day. Uh, we're coming back though for the festival like two weekends from now. So we are making our way still down Route 66. We actually just hit the halfway point um, right before we got out of Texas in Adrian, Texas, I think it is, is the halfway point for Route 66. And then um, we will be making our way down through uh, or across rather through New Mexico, Arizona, and then ending in LA at Santa Monica Pier. That's the end of Route 66. And we will have done all of it from Chicago to LA. Next week, we're going to be spending some time at Disneyland, which we haven't been to in maybe 
five years, I think. So I'm really excited to go to Disneyland. Toaster is going to have a little rover vacation. We found a great person for him to stay with that just loves dogs, has a dog, has a fenced in yard. So he's going to have a fun time. Um, but yeah, we've got some great stuff coming up. Very excited for it. I finally finished reading uh, Book Lovers by Emily Henry. It was a good book. I kind of, I was really into it at first. It petered off for me a bit at the end, but it was a cute book overall. And then I started two fantastic books this week. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this one out. It's right here. Let's see. Is that the right one? I kind of rearranged my stuff over here. I don't know if you can see me. I kind of rearranged my stuff over here so Toaster could have one of these cubbies. Oh, sorry, sorry. Shaking, shaking. Um, okay, so as soon as I finished Book Lovers, I started my book of the month from August called None of This is True by Lisa Jewell. And I got like 30 pages into it. I am hooked on it. And then a book that I had been wanting to borrow from the library. I remembered that I had borrowed it while I was still reading Book Lovers and I only had six days left to finish it. And it was a, it's a brand new book. Like it just came out August 29th. And so I wasn't gonna be able to get it back for a while. So I was like, oh shoot, I better stop this one. So good, can't wait to keep reading it later though. And start that book. And that one is also just keeping my interest. It's super, super good. I'm almost done with it. Um, it is called The Brothers Hawthorne by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. It is the fourth book in the Inheritance Games series. And if you like young adult reads um, and you like like puzzle, like kind of mystery solving things, you're going to really, really like this. There's not like, it's not a murder mystery. It's more just like, it's the, the series starts with Avery who is just like a regular everyday person who inherits um, randomly, it seems, inherits um, a billionaire's fortune. And the billionaire has passed away and his grandsons, there's four of them, um, are like giving Avery all these, all this grief. And then there's like all these puzzles and things they have to solve that the grandfather has left for them to figure out like, why did Avery um, inherit all this money? I think it's a really well-written series. It's very interesting. Um, as soon as I finished the third book and I knew there was a fourth coming, I suggested it to my library, which is why I think I got it from the library so quickly after it released. Because again, it just came out like August 29th of 2023. So I'm, I'm eating it up. It is so great. Um, so I'm really excited to have two books that I am loving this week. Uh, we haven't really watched anything. There ha wasn't a lot of time for TV, so that's pretty much it for the life section. My tip of the week for you this week is a bit of a different one. It's not a uh, technique or anything. It is to plan a budget for festival shopping. I know this may seem a tiny bit hypocritical if you did watch the DFW Fiberfest video. I am in a different place now um, with yarn literally being my job than I was, you know, maybe three or four or five years ago um, when I was working on a teaching budget and I just didn't buy as much yarn. It was a different kind of expense now than it is. But this is what I did then and it was always the best shopping experience for me. So we have a lot of things coming up. You may be going to Rhinebeck. You may be going to the, um, the festival in New Mexico. You may be going to Vogue. You may just be planning for a local yarn crawl. Whatever you are doing, it is so much more fun to shop when you don't have to stress about the money. So this is how I like to plan. Um, when I have several months leading up to the event, I kind of anticipate a budget. I either work it from a total that you want to save before you go and then break it down by the months that you have left. Okay, I want to save $500, then I need to save like $100 a month for five months. Um, or you can do it from the other way. Um, this is how much I can save per month and this is how many months I have left until the festival. There's three months to go. I can set aside $50 a month if I don't do this. You know, maybe if I don't get coffee or something like that. Or maybe you can just set it aside at the beginning of the month, you know, and that way you don't touch it, get it out of cash, whatever you need to do. 
And so, you know, I can save $50 a month for three months. I will have $150 that I have set aside that I can shop with guilt-free at this next festival. For me, when I was able to do this and save in advance and like get out cash and have that, I had the most fun shopping because I didn't feel worried or stressed or anything like that. So hopefully that tip helps you if you are somebody who wants to go and shop. Um, I know not everyone is in the same place. I know not everyone has the same desires or outcomes for what they're doing, um, but keep that in the back of your mind if that is ever uh, a place that you are in. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here in New Mexico. Next week, I'll be joining you from a completely different state. Can't wait to see you then. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.